Bonsoir à tous. Good evening to all of you. Um, thank you, Amory. I am Jean Manuel Rodriguez. I work for OP3F. Uh, where I am in charge of sharing knowledge. And more precisely, uh, part of my mission is to see to it that the users and other players in the ecosystem, internet ecosystem, uh, get the answers to their questions about OP3FT or about the Frogans technology. In fact, if you were to uh, come uh, across me here or elsewhere, the first question that you could uh, ask me would be, what is the Frogan's technology? But tonight, I am not in charge of answering this question. It will be for Alexei Tamas uh, to do it. He's the co-inventor of the Frogan's technology, and he will be answering this question uh, as in the form of an interview, because I will be interacting with him in front of you. So, good evening, Alexey. Good evening to all of you, and thank you for coming here uh, uh, for this first conference. And so, Jean-Emmanuel, I will answer this uh, question. So, first of all, I suggest we start, uh, or you start, by introducing yourself and, and your role in the Frogans uh, project. Well, with uh, Amori, who introduced the evening. I am the, the, the co-founder of this project, um, and then a, non a number of people who uh, joined us um, uh, to pioneer the project very early on. And I'm in charge of the technical side of um, the project and its uh, dissemination among the technical communities. And I um, coordinate the various uh, technical aspects, uh, improving the technology, and a number of people also have contributed to this uh, in in the room. Uh, so this is my role uh, to make sure that things uh, work smoothly. So thank you, Alexey. You were talking about the Frogan technology and project. Uh, uh, I would like to put this into perspective at the beginning of the project. In fact, uh, what were the leading uh, ideas that uh, guided you uh, and Amori to get the project off the ground? Well, initially, in Amory's mind and myself, we we were, say, at the end of the 1990s, very early 2000, we were looking at this uh, growth of the Internet uh, with scores of Internet sites that were mushering around. And what we had observed, we had already been uh, involved uh, as cons uh, IT consultants uh, developing sites. And early on, we realized that, in fact, um, this huge uh, development of the Internet with the publishing of websites in particular, you'll see that one of our uh, light motives is to say that websites are not the internet, it's just an application of the internet. And you'll see how important this um, consideration uh, will become when we start talking about the layers later on. So we had noted that um, this environment was uh, uh, expanding so rapidly. And what we thought was amazing is that first, that was 10 years ago and more, the websites were with uh, came along with lots of problems of security related to the browsers, which themselves uh, involved a number of uh, security issues. And 10, 15 years down the line, it's not quite better. You still, uh, I mean, the, the, the browsers are fraught with uh, security issues. And, and in parallel with this, we, we thought it was strange that uh, after year 2000, uh, we were still struggling with these security issues. And the second thing that we thought strange, uh, and this was the case even before the emergence of the mobile internet, which we know now with the uh, tablets and mobile uh, terminals uh, over the last five or six years. In fact, we began to realize that the people developing websites were in uh, totally um, struggling with uh, mobility. They had to start over again everything they had. They had to redevelop for 
new mobile dev devices. They had to rethink, re-engineer the ergonomics of the website. So these two uh, core ideas, we thought, uh, uh, needed uh, someone to, to address them. I mean, uh, technology is, is, is not here to make your life more difficult. It's to make your life easier. That's uh, my uh, credo. So uh, we thought we needed to address this. Of course, this I'm already said that maybe we slightly underestimated the, uh, the, the mm, sheer size of this issue because um, it, it was complicated and and and, and the volume uh, of uh, of number of users of size of devices uh, started. Uh, uh, booming over the last 10 years and with this Frogans uh, project we thought we needed to address this problem and if you're here tonight it's because we're just about reaching uh, it's coming to fruition in fact so um, yes you, you, I understand what you said if I um, uh, get your point you are working on the Frogans uh, uh, project and have been for the last 10 years now the Frogans technology and the Provence project. Well, in fact, um, what can I ask you? Tell us about the the, the project uh, itself now. Well, I have uh, some form of illustration here to yeah. So you have seen this if you've um, connected, logged on to the uh, frogans.org uh, site. This is the very uh, fundamental um, uh, chart, if you will. And so it shows wh what Frogans is about and what it is not about. Uh, innovation on the internet, you, most of the time, is located, uh, which, as we see it, is in the, the service offering and the contents offering, like Twitter, Facebook, uh, when they emerge, they uh, develop a website and they convey a number of services around the website. So these major websites, uh, search engines or others, uh, use an infrastructure that they do not themselves develop. Uh, typically, what they do is they launch a website, they buy a domain name, they buy the servers or they rent them, they pr start producing and off they go on the internet. Now, whilst you've said that, uh, Frogans is not about this. It's a new system that will allow these people or others or challengers, uh, I mean, Facebook, tweeters or their challengers, or other people who have, or companies who have sites, to uh, develop new types of sites that will address the problems of security, as I said, or and also ease of use in publishing. Uh, it means being able to go fast, but also spend less in producing your, your content and, uh, and updating the, the, them. Now, to understand programs, you need to understand how uh, the internet works. Sorry to go about to go through this again, but it's based on th several layers, operational layers, operating layers, which are almost invisible to the users, to the end user. And invisible because, except uh, for the internet connection, which you have to pay for, but once you've got the internet connection, you buy a computer and and, and and then you, you go browsing, you've got the browser inside it most of the time, the internet, um, and you go on the, internet, the website. So this is how it works. Now, the network uh, is organized into three you know, layers. You've got the telecoms uh, infrastructures, the uh, fiber optics, the uh, undersea under um, cables or Wi-Fi, etc. It's a basic uh, transportation network uh, to convey uh, the data. Uh, but you could do voice without the internet too. Uh, and above this layer, you have another layer, uh, which is standardized, a software layer, which is the internet um, uh, software. I'm not going into this uh, um, uh, area because it's not our area, our core skill. Uh, this uh, zone, this area, is a set of protocols of uh, standards of uh, systems. Also, well, there's uh, these, uh, you have the domain name system, the DNS, for instance, and these allow you to, um, so that allow 
every machine connected to the network to exchange packets of data in a consistent and global manner. That is a, connect, a computer connected in China or in the United States, in France, in Peru or elsewhere um, from an address that has been assigned to it should be able to exchange data with any other computer uh, elsewhere in the world. This is the magic of the internet, this interconnection of all um, internet devices via the IP um, protocol. So the IP address is fundamental in that it gives you access to uh, the uh, transmission and reception of information over the network. Now, uh, the internet alone is great, but it's, it does not do a lot because these is, it allows you to exchange data. But what allows you to enjoy all of this is when you have generic uh, applications, uh, software pieces that have been developed on top of this. And traditionally, the first uh, software layers were revolving around email, that is, um, systems to exchange uh, electronic uh, messages. And little by little, as uh, the system was quite open, its strength being that it allowed anyone to uh, create a new um, generic application. And this network allowed uh, the emergence of new software layers, applications layer, the most well-known of uh, which, uh, which has uh, in a way uh, overshadowed the, the rest, is the web, the World Wide Web. You know maybe that it was uh, invented at, at the um, uh, European Center for Nuclear Research in Geneva by an English um, engineer called Tim Bernersley to uh, solve problems that they were faced with, and in particular publishing problems, and how to link uh, between the uh, to the, the, the documents that were published. So, uh, of course, you, the, the history of the internet can be um, read on many uh, sites on the web. You can read it for yourself if you haven't done so already. So once you've got this, uh, anybody can use these uh, applications. If you publish a website, if you're a publisher of websites, you could you will look for a domain name and then you will host your site on uh, a machine or, or using all the World Wide Web technologies and the internet technologies below. Once you've got this, forget about this, or, or, except for fragrance, actually. But once you've got this, you see that many users on top of this, um, publishers of contents and services, uh, agencies, uh, uh, IT services companies, uh, uh, content creators, uh, hosting providers, uh, software publishers uh, who take part in a content creation production ecosystem. No one knows exactly how many websites there are. There are several hundreds of millions on the internet. And for domain names, it's uh, just about uh, the same uh, numbers or 200 million uh, and more. Uh, online. So we can imagine that all this is uh, based on technologies that are uh, published by organizations. The web belongs to no one. It doesn't belong to a, any trading company. It belongs to a consortium of players who are acting in the general interest to develop it, avoiding other influences to trying to make it evolve in one direction or another. Forgant is here. It's a generic application on the Internet by providing this generic technology like between 1989 and 1992 Tim Burley sent his World Wide Web in production for operation and you'll have a new software layer that's now been set up on the internet network. Things have changed. At the time, you had to be great to make the web, to think of it. But it was quite simple, technically speaking. Today, to make programs, I don't know if you have to be a genius, but it's complicated. But now, the scale is much more significant since we have far more users. And the strong pressure by the entire ecosystem that wants everything straight away. And problems that are significant from the outset in terms of globalization, because these publishers are not always doing ASCII using Latin characters without accents. You have users around the world which have their own problems. So we have worked and we're still working a lot on that. And we have many users today on the internet and they too have their expectations. They have lots of different terminals. So it looks like mission impossible, but we're getting there after years of work. And above all, 
with a team that has succeeded in dealing with all of these problems one by one. So that was just to tell you where we stand in the network with respect to what exists today. So when you spoke about a new layer, it's about introducing a new generic layer here on the internet. Thank you, Alexey. I think that everyone would like to know now, can you put up the slide once again, please? Thank you so much. I'm saying thank you to Camille as well, who's over there in the corner, and she's passing the slides, and at the same time, she's an excellent legal expert at the same time. But I'm sure that we'll see about that at the next conference. So we're in the Forgans layer, as you explained. Alexei, but Forgans, concretely, when it goes up here, what forms the Forgans technology? And what is it that will allow end users, the publishers, and content uh, uh, publishers to do something with it. Well, the various components of Forgans, we have four, in fact. Well, there are more. Let's say have four large families, first of all. Well, we can do it in all, in, any way around. Starting with the end user, let's say. You have end users and you have a software for browsing. So you have a browser. We called it Forgans Player. It's actually a small software, a small browser for positioning yourself and and looking for Frogan sites and exploring Frogan sites and displaying them on screen. We'd have loved to call it Frogan's Explorer. That was the best name, but was already used for the web. So we opted for Frogan's Player to stay standard. So we have a software. This software is available on the maximum terminals connected to the network, open. So mobile terminals, smartphones, tablets, and so on, but also fixed terminals that at the outset were dealt with in our project. All of this on various types of operating systems, Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and so on. The same for mobile terminals. So the first thing, you have a software for the user. That software is free of use, of course, downloadable for free, no need to register. Of course, this is a totally uh, a uh, system that's totally open to users. So it's a small software that you can find on get.frogans, the first way of using our new GTLD. We'll also find it in application stores. It's the only way to to distribute applications and some mobile terminals. That's the first component. Technically speaking, so this is the vis visible part. That's enough for the end user. Now, for professionals, you have a language, a description language for formatting for organ sites. For those of you who know HTML, a language that has evolved a lot and that is still evolving, we're now at release five. And the equivalent in Frogans is a language called FSDL, Frogan Slide Description Language. It's based on XML with tags, real XML, XML strict, full XML, something that's not really exposed to security issues. And that allows us to develop sites. An extremely simple language as compared with HTML5. If you try to print it, you have over a thousand pages of documents to print out, not to speak of all these related specifications. So I hope that it will hold in less than 100 pages in the final version. You can do everything with it. I'm sorry to interrupt you. The 1,000 pages to print, you're talking about the technical specs of HTML5. Yes, exactly. Thank you for that. So it becomes a specification used by computers much more so than the men who encode them. HTML5 has become something extremely difficult. So with this uh, language, FSD, 
El Frog, and we'll be proposing to all developers or creators uh, something that's easy to handle, that's more accessible, easy to use. The third pillar, let's say, in Frogan's technology is that it's an address, it is an address system. As Amory said, and we'll talk about that tomorrow in the last presentation with Romuald, Frogan's websites operate with new addresses. These new identifiers we call Frogan's addresses, and that are the equivalent of domain names and websites. These Frogan's addresses, each uh, Frogan site has an address, and there are many possibilities for those addresses. You can use them for looking around on the internet. You can personalize them, customize them entirely or not, on intranets as well. Now, if you talk about providing identifiers of the internet, that means making sure that they're not distributed in several copies. Otherwise, there will be issues with security. So, like for all identifier systems, such as domain names, you have a register. So, th there's a core database called F. CR, Frogan's core registry, which contains all Frogan's addresses registered, attributing them to the users or to those who'd like to register one. And it will be managed by a, an independent entity, a separate. I'll come back to that later on. So it's not just an entity, it was the founder of the initial project, but its role has, uh, is that now it is in charge of managing the registry. So that is how the system works. Thank you, Alexei. I did two in one. I spoke about the addresses and the registries. Okay, I may be speaking for the people in the room, but is it possible? You spoke about Frogan's sites and addresses. Now, could you show us something? A visual, a presentation, a prototype. Listen, I will show you two or three slides because I can't put one up directly. Maybe you could put one up. This is an, uh, taken from, you have to go back in time a bit. Oh, for example, this one. I'll show you two or three slides that Romuald took to Linta, Hong Kong, two weeks ago with David and Benjamin to present what we're talking about tomorrow. We will see, with respect to making Frogan sites, I will show our first and second mobile prototypes to show you how it works. Essentially, what you should take away is this for a Frogan site. Let me show you the second one first before coming back to that one. If you look at an old PC screen that will last for some time from years to come, a Frogan's website will look like a window that has the form that the, uh, that the publisher gave it. We can find content that you can browse in and that is decided upon by the author. This Frogan site, we will find find it I, I, identically in the same format on the various terminals, on a tablet, on a telephone. For me, it's a bit fuzzy and it's not a great definition, but normally the definition is great, with the ability to integrate a lot of text, pictures, and content. Now, each program site will be composed of several pages. We call them slides. This is why we have the acronym a fly, a slide description language, FSDL. So we will find some content inside. Ah, just before that. One important thing is that this rendering, this visual rendering, will be strictly the same on the various terminals. You won't have, let's say, if you're a creator of a Frogan site or a provider creating uh, Frogan sites for someone or developer for a small author trying to make WYSIWYG, you will see that there's absolutely no change to be made depending on the terminal. You make one version of the content. For example, you have this wonderful page, Lorem Ipsum, and you no longer need to worry to worry about whether or not the rendering will be different on an iPhone or on an, my Linux 64-bit, will it work? Or on my Mac, will it be different? Here you'll have exactly the same rendering. Even when you publish, and maybe not in this room, I don't know, but globally, if you publish in Arabic or in Russian 
or in other languages, you will also have that rendering guaranteed. It's not magic. It has to be managed for it to work, but this is something we can look at to, into in greater depth tomorrow. I mean, it's not magic, it's technology. So once you've said that, in this uh, release one of Furgans, we'll be able to make any shape, put international text, and to set up links to other publishing systems like the web or email, or the internet layers are interoperable. That is essential on the internet. So links to websites and from websites as well towards Frogan sites, of course. And buttons too for browsing. So Frogan site is not just what I just showed you. It's also a system where you can browse from page to page, slide to slide, offering a special experience to users. You can put images, and lastly, you can generate these Frogan slides dynamically. In other words, it's not just static content. For example, if you have content that changes over time, depending on browsing, for example, you can also, let's say, if you want to put a webcam picture, or if you want to put an answer from a search engine inside of Frogan's website, you can. Now, what is indicated here is that this content is secure, meaning that even if you're the bad guy and you want, with your Frogan site, to publish hours to take over the machine of someone who stumbled on your website, you won't be able to do it. Oh, that's what we're trying to do anyway. I think we will make it. And why won't you be able to do that? Because entire technology was thought out from day one with that in mind. We thought we needed to protect a user, given the possible attacks, not the majority, but it calls for little for it to become a disaster, possible attacks by an evil-doing publisher trying to put you on content that will make your browser crash after installing something that will cause damage for you. So that is the user protection principle. I'll come back to this tomorrow on how Frogan sites are developed, but they're very small in size and weight, and that's great. Even for mobile networks, four, five, ten. So we're, sometimes you're happy when the content can go through. On, con on Frogan, content will go through all the time, even if it's a single bar on your telephone, because it's very small in size. So we will have a very responsive system as compared to current publishing systems. The last point that I'll speak about that tomorrow is very open to creativity. So we can do anything you want to do. Here's what you get on screen. So we will tell you what are the key points tomorrow. And the last thing for Frogan's address, because in fact, immediately, that's the, end, that's the point of entry. You don't need a Frogan address if you're a professional. But if you want to publish, you need to have an address at some point in time. So Frogan's addresses are written in five scripts that are supported immediately, five out of ten, I believe, ten or eleven scripts that we'll be supporting. Latin, simplified Chinese, Cyrillic, Hebrew, Arabic. So you can see that the Frogan's addresses are written from right to left in Hebrew and Arabic. And you also have Japanese, Korean, Thai, Greek, Devanagari, and so on. So network name, star, site name. Now the star, I was told that in Hebrew is not it. We made a mistake. We used Google Translate to do this, but we didn't know how to write network name, star, site name, so don't, don't uh, stick to this. But what are the points in common for all these addresses? The star. So the distinctive sign for us, Frogan's address in this technological universe is not like for email addresses or the whoa, whoa, whoa with an HTTP colon slash slash followed by dot com dot with a long URL for websites. For Frogan sites, addresses, it's a very simple address with a star. A star, a member before and after the star. And this is what the publishers can use to design interesting publishing space with the star. 
Thank you, Alexei. I can see that time is running by. All of this is exciting. As you said, you spoke about Forgan sites, Forgan addresses, and the database, too. The Forgan score registry, you'll be speaking about that tomorrow. But I heard you speak a lot about security, about creativity for publishers, meeting the needs of publishers and meeting the needs, too, of users in terms of security, and free international access. What I would like to know, to conclude, to give the uh, to allow the uh, floor to speak, when you started at the beginning of the year 2000, what were your objectives for the Frogans project? Let's say, in terms of its philosophy, what's for sure is the next slide. Okay, so initially this project was not set up by OP3FT, which has existed for just over two years now. Initially it was set up with Amori by STG Interactive, that became this registry operator we spoke of. Today, but since the very outset, we've been thinking of things with Amory. And Amory, and I'm the technician, let's say, Amory is there to guarantee that things continue in line with our initial vision. In fact, we regrouped on this document that is also available on the site, the issues that are the long-term challenges. Of course, we need short-term technology. We need to solve problems. We need to support the new iPhone or the new Android or the new whatever. But you also have things that you must do, decisions to take every day with a vision. This is our vision over several years of what you must think of all the time. The first thing, the four points that are very simple. The first is that this is a publishing system. You have the web users on the one hand and publishers on the other. They have exchanges and discussions through a technology. We need to maintain a balance between these two players on the internet. It's very difficult to maintain that balance because once you see a publisher, he wants to take control, even though he's not a hacker, but he wants to take over your ter the terminal. He has lots of very invasive ideas. What if you could do this in addition? I could find out the configuration of the station used by the end user. You may go up via FD, FSDL to get information. That could be useful. So they have lots of creative ideas, but they are not exactly in line with the project's philosophy. Also, end users, they also have more and more demands in terms of privacy, demands in terms of simplicity, security. So there are things we'd like to do, to do, but we can't, to preserve that balance. The second important point, and we'll come back to this several times, is that OP3FT, they're not just making a software, they're making technical specifications too, like internet standards, FSDL is one, there are seven or nine other standards around this technology, the Forgans addresses included. And the third point, Julie will be speaking about this just afterwards, we will need, well, Julie and Thomas as well, we will need to develop policies or charters uh, develop policies so that users can use this technology in a reasonable way, um, respectful of each other. This is brand new, and we must be consistent in this approach, and that's not easy either. A third point, I have said this constantly, we mean to keep it simple and secure. And this too forces us to make changes, to think before we act. When we innovate, it's really easy to make code, to produce code. You come out with a wonderful feature for geolocalization, 3D, and then you think, but if we do this, is it secure? The guy, when he passes in front of his place with his fog and sight open, they know where he is. There may be problems around that. So we need to think about security and simplicity 
and I'll do that all the time. And lastly, so this is a major challenge for OP3FT. This has been written in the very bylaws of OP3FT, this desire, this need now for the project to foster uh, the economy, even though not directly, because we're providing a technology for free. But after all, we must promote the ability for people to have exchanges for free or paying using Fogan technology. So this is not easy. There are people at OP3FT working on how to promote the emergence of users working in intelligently, respectfully, and at the same time, who can develop the economic activities that cost a lot of effort. The word ecosystem is very trendy today. Everything's an ecosystem today. If I'm a baker, I have my ecosystem of people who come to buy bread every day. Here we speak about a worldwide e ecosystem, meaning the community of all internet users. It's a global ecosystem and multicultural because we have people from around the world, as you can see. So these are the four objectives for us. Each time we take a decision, if one day you try to influence us, you know that at OPS3FT, everyone at some point in time will look at your ideas carefully, and some ideas will be accepted, some ideas can be transformed to make them possible, and others will say, no, it doesn't really work. It's not consistent with our project. So I think that this is one important point to understand the work and project and what we're trying to do. We have a 10-year vision. We're, we've been around for over 10 years. Why not think over the next 10 years? That's not a problem for us to think over the long term. So we'll try to keep track of these guidelines, to follow these guidelines to set our roadmap, helping us to take smart decisions. So if this has to evolve one day, well, it will be a major effort, because I believe that this vision is full of stability and is there for the long run. Thank you so much, Alexi. I want to ask you any more questions. Let me turn towards people in the audience. We have Gwendal over there somewhere. And Alexi is there to answer your questions. I myself, if I can, and everyone from OP3FT, if your questions are specific. Let's take a few questions for a few minutes. Are there any questions? I have the projector right in my eyes, and I can see a lot of movement in the audience. And the winner is... Could you please introduce yourself? I'm Philippe Franchet. I would like to know, for you, what will lead to a gradual movement of developers from conventional HTML5 to Fogan technology? What are the technical key points that you may present briefly? But why is it that these people would make that step, that the world at large will have to follow Fogan's technology? Right. Well, they would really make that step. They just move by one toe. Because everything works exactly on the basic technology. To host a program site you will use, or you can use, if you are a developer, you can use HTTP servers that are traditional servers for hosting websites. Now, on top of that, for the content itself, you'll use XML. For today, for the industry, XML is a standard. And therefore, filling in XML templates instead of HTML templates, that's not a top, that's not an issue for developers. Thirdly, there are lots like that, actually. Thirdly, it's not revamping the system in that you will change it entirely, you'll make new content. So the technical community will be facing a lot of creative people with lots of ideas, and for once, and we have tested this out, just imagine, for once, technicians are delighted, because they do lots of things in one go. It works immediately, they have nothing to do. And the users are very happy. Because you saw Melika join earlier with Romuald around the program site. The client or the person who placed the order for the content can draw it. That changes everything because then they take control of the content. Whereas before they proposed them something they didn't understand that was rolled out. You had buttons below, you had to go up. This have to do it all over again because at the bottom of the page, I don't want to have buttons. 
to roll up, and then it becomes expensive and painful. So the technical community, when we show them programs, they have lots of ideas quickly, and they realize that it's very uh, rapid to adopt, technically speaking. We had large companies that were ready to set, test out the project gradually, and the people that we could easily convince with IT directors, because they told us, well, they, they saw us coming in with a terrible migraine, saying, okay, what is it that people from marketing are coming in with some crazy idea? After listening to us for 10 minutes, they realized that there were XML files to put in the server, and then they could use port 80, which is standard uh, HTTP port, no need for a firewall, and that on their system, they could interconnect with Java, PHP, in any dynamic program on the server, it would be interfaced immediately with the databases and the final analysis. They had the feeling that nothing changed for them at their level. But for users, or those who place these, or oh, this was interesting because once, all of a sudden, they were in control of content with well-targeted communication exercises, trying to make things that a conventional website could not. We're not trying well, to say that people who have ideas should come over to the giants of technology. No, people from te technology will see this and say, well, of course. And we are hosted that people where uh, security is vital. Have I answered your question? Thank you, Alice. Yeah, I see there are other hands. Thank you, Gwendal. Uh, uh, not only passes the microphone beautifully, but he's also a great project manager. So, Etienne Condel, um, I'm a teacher at Salsa, um, and this is how I, I've known Alexei. Uh, or, could you, you tell us, you were talking about, for instance, this capacity to change the, the, the forms. We're not too familiar with this because we had the feeling from the uh, slides that you showed that it's like a form that is uh, moving across the screen without any frame, without. Um, so it will provide great plasticity in a way. So, how would you relate this more from a you know, user's from the user's point of view, so that the user the user will know where they stand? Because I I remember some office uh, mm, software where you had a sheep across the screen, and it, uh, you see what I mean? Yeah. Well, this is one of the key points in terms of the economics of the system because we have a publishing interface on the screen, so we need to be sure that the user will uh, very easily handle it know and understand what he's got on the screen and that it will not disappear all of a sudden and that they can't retrieve it for instance so this is one of the big issues and I think uh, there will be a presentation later on from um, someone telling us about the user interfaces and we pay great attention and this is one of our highest concerns and this is one of the first things that we address in the project to make these interfaces easily um, usable and, and uh, easy to handle. So these windows will stay at, on top of the main windows. They can be resized, but within a certain scale. Now, the publisher, we've thought of lots of things, you know, and we've experienced with a number of publishers to realize that they were not quite rational in the way they um, did things. You, you're not here to produce invisible windows, so the surface of a frog in sight will be uh, decided by a number of rules. For instance, you cannot do one pixel on the screen, and then you can't um, uh, click on it to switch it off. And then addressing systems. There's nothing worse than not knowing where something you've got on the screen comes from, because something can change in, fo in, in form and shape. You see, there, for instance, with a the triangle here, but two slides down the line, it will be a circle, and then you don't know whether it's the same site or not. It's a bit disturbing. So what we've done is that we've got a menu behind every frog in sight, a context-based menu where you have the frog in's address that's written, and then you have um, a number of uh, very easy uh, uh, handling uh, functions like switch on, off, have it disappear, or uh, change the scale if you can't hold it, uh, grow. Have a grip on it from the side. You can resize it. It can be uh, resized from the center. This is something new in particular. So in a few minutes, you'll understand how it works, and then you you can use it very smoothly. We did through lots of um, 
use that testing and you'll, you'll see that for yourself very soon, which is quite fun. In three minutes, you will get used to Frogan's site to resize it, uh, handle it, mani manipulate it, and you'll see <clears throat> a number of things will become very natural in a few minutes, the three minutes. And then after, you will be uh, trying to use all the windows on your uh, on, on your screen the same way. It's, it's, like, uh, the, it's a very mm, natural usage in a way and um, very instinctive. So, of course, on the phone it will not be exactly the same because uh, you're not in an immersive mode in, on mobile phones, for instance. It's beginning to change now. But at the present day, an application cannot be uh, superimposed on another application uh, because of the size restrictions, so it's not one on top of the other. But on the screen, on the large screen, we've um, organized the distribution of space. Now, uh, if TVs are now opening up with new uh, open uh, operating systems, uh, so we'll be able to have a frozen site that we can handle with the uh, whatever device, that uh, remote control that you want to use and it will be superimposed on the um, TV program. What's nice about it is that if you have identified the, sh the form of a site, you will be able to find it um, on all terminals afterwards. It's like someone who was telling me that for three years that they want to leave home with their frozen site on their they wake up with their frozen site on their phone, then uh, on in the public transport they use their tablet, it's the same uh, form, and Next, in the office, uh, they, they have the same on their desktop. <clears throat> That's a dream, but soon it will be done. And so, uh, all the way back home on your TV, uh, in, uh, where you can still have your frozen site superimposed on your TV program, uh, a reality show, in effect. So, uh, whatever is, is uh, device independent, it will. Now, another question the technology, in fact, is aiming to compete or replace the, the web, uh, essentially, or uh, is it. No. No. Well, you're not going to replace the, the, the web with a frozen site. It's quite visible here. No, it's something that will come as an addition, a complement. It's a new channel for publishers to um, address the, the cybernauts in another situation, in another type of relationship. It will open up new capacity and new capabilities also. And from this angle, we've got loads of ideas, but we realize that at OP3, FT, we have fewer IDs than the outsiders who watch us because that's why we don't want to do too many demos because we're limited in the opera. But as soon as you put, you give the toy to the babies, you know, they they work out scores of IDs. It's like when we did prototyping in 2004 or five, we had mm, taken a, a young trainee from a secondary school, you know, for two weeks, and we told him we'll play with this. And in in a few uh, minutes or hours, he uh, developed a, 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 a maze in the forest with just nothing. Uh, they had he, had he he took 100 photos from forests, you know, and uh, he had developed a maze a, a system and, and a game uh, on, with the frogans. and. Uh, so I suppose Amoui will remember this. Now, um, no, it's not here to replace uh, the web. It's just a compliment to the web. And some people say, well, no, but you're not uh, telling us the, tru you, uh, the truth. You are going to replace it. No, no, truly not. And uh, along the same idea, you could compare this with uh, instant messaging and email. Instant messaging works like a layer of the internet. And the and the email uh, is different, and there's not one that replaces the other. Is it's two um, different um, situations of communication, and one thing which may uh, maybe we need to be vigilant and careful about is to continue to develop uh, uh, along this mode and not try to add too much on top to absorb the website and put it in the frog inside. No, it would be meaningless, pointless. Merci, Thank you, Jean-Manuel. <laughs>